Hello, everyone. Welcome back and welcome to another episode during ADHD Awareness Month. Today, I'm going to share an episode, a conversation I had with Dr. Stephen Hinshaw about girls and ADHD. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today, we're going to have an important conversation. We have a lot of important conversations, but this one is particularly important because we are going to have some straight talk about ADHD in girls. My guest today is Dr. Stephen Hinshaw, Distinguished Professor of Psychology at the University of California, Berkeley, where he was department chair from 2004 to 2011. He is also professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Hinshaw's work focuses on developmental psychopathology, clinical interventions with children and adolescents, and mental illness stigma. He has directed research programs and conducted clinical trials and longitudinal studies for children with inattention and impulse control problems. Dr. Hinshaw has authored over 400 articles, chapters, and commentaries, and 13 books, including his most recent book, Straight Talk About ADHD and Girls, How to Help Your Daughter Thrive. It is such an honor to have Dr. Hinshaw here with me today. Millions of kids struggle with learning, processing, and social-emotional difficulties. These challenges interfere with their ability to reach their full potential. Dr. Karen Wilson is here to help. Her extensive background in pediatric neuropsychology and higher education have prepared her for this unique mission. Listen as she delivers content to inform, educate, and empower parents and educators. This will enable you to identify challenges that kids face and get them on the road to achieving their full potential. This is Diverse Thinking, Different Learning by Child Nexus. Dr. Hinshaw, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on. I'm so pleased to have you here to talk about ADHD and girls. We've talked about ADHD before on the podcast, but I really wanted to focus on girls. And I was thrilled to hear about your book that just came out. And we're going to absolutely link to it in the show notes. And I just want to jump right in because we know that ADHD is estimated that between 5 and 11% of kids have ADHD. It's more prevalent in boys than girls. Does that mean that more boys have ADHD or is it the girls are more likely to be overlooked? Uh, yes, to all of the above. So let's, <laughs> let's take it from the top. Okay. Neurodevelopmental disorders, ADHD, autism spectrum, Tourette's, some forms of learning disorders, very early onset conduct disorder are actually more prevalent in boys than girls. Girls from the word go in the first few years of life are more socially attuned than boys, have higher empathy, are more compliant, they're more verbal. So it's not an accident that conditions of self-regulation, social abilities, et cetera, would be more prevalent in boys. However, for the last 100 to 200 years, these conditions have essentially been ignored in girls. It's been 10 to 1 or 20 to 1 boys to girls looking at clinics. In the real world, autism is about 3 to 1 boys to girls. ADHD is about 2.5 to 1. Learning disorders may be 1.5 to 1. Extremely early uh, onset conduct disorder is 6 to 1. But the very name, hyperkinesis, hyperactivity, on the boy symptom the obstreperous Tom Sawyer syndrome, running around a classroom. Girls who meet criteria for ADHD are more likely than boys to have the exclusively inattentive form. It can get missed because they're not disrupting a classroom, they're suffering in silence. Many girls as well in grade school, they're trying hard, a lot of perfectionism, a lot of family coping and compensation, Really pulling it together and then middle school hits and there's multiple teachers and the press for high executive functions is stronger than ever. High school, college, workforce, people I know and have worked with, and there's a case example in the new book, Straight Talk on ADHD and Girls, 
don't really get diagnosed until grad school when now the load is extremely hard and high. So I want to make something quite clear. ADHD, ADD, ADHD, the newer names than hyperactivity, hyperkinesis, imply that there's a deficit in attention. But if that's the case, why do so many people with ADHD show hyperfocus? If they're in a very engaging, intrinsically motivating activity, they can't stop for eight hours at a time. So what we have to consider is, is that ADHD, both the inattentive form of the condition and the more combined hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention, is more a disorder of the ability to regulate attention and focus as situations and tasks shift. So you get hyper-focus on an intrinsically motivating activity and very hard time focusing on a boring lecture or very difficult material. It's a self-regulatory disorder. And if we recognize that girls may, again, tend to have the more exclusively inattentive form, their symptoms may be masked for longer than those of boys because of the perfectionism and the compensatory anxiety. And clinicians think, well, it's just anxiety or depression. It can't be ADHD because it doesn't exist in girls. It can. You need a thorough history. You need to get normed rating scales from parents and teachers. You need to do testing as needed. You can't diagnose ADHD well in boys or girls in a five to 15 minute general pediatric visit. It takes some time and effort. Absolutely, absolutely. And we know that ADHD looks very different across the spectrum in girls and boys, but are girls different in how they present with ADHD? I know you mentioned that more of them may have the inattentive presentation, which people often describe as the hidden disorder, but there are, are there other differences with girls and boys? Is there a reason why they're not getting diagnosed earlier and at the same rates the boys do. I'll go back to what I said a moment ago. The old name was hyperactivity, hyperkinesis. We have worked with, and there are girls in the world who are pretty darn active and ornery and can be on wheels to deal with in a classroom or home. But more often, a girl who shows those symptoms may be hyperverbal rather than hyper physically active. So it's I don't think if we change the symptoms, we should or could make the rates in boys and girls exactly equal. It'd be like saying depression in men. Well, women are twice or more as likely as men to have major depression. Well, men show depression through antisocial behavior or drinking. And if we just change the criteria, it would be even. Well, then we don't know if we're talking about depression anymore. I don't think it's truly equal, although it does get more equal by adulthood, which we can talk about. But the point is that there may be subtler manifestations, interrupting hyperverbality rather than hyperactivity, difficulties reading social cues. And of course, girls put a real premium on smooth social interactions and a lot of verbal skills. So girls are, again, suffering in silence. It may not be as noticeable as a boy tearing around a classroom, but the consequences, as we'll probably discuss, for girls who clearly have ADHD, as they get into adolescence and adulthood, there's some very serious consequences if they don't get early intervention. Yes, and I can see how that would result in unique challenges for girls. And you have done extensive research on girls with ADHD in your lab, and you have followed them over time, a longitudinal research. I'd love for you to talk about what does ADHD look like in girls over time, because I think that is so important. So this is the Berkeley Girls with ADHD Longitudinal Study, BGALS. Always good to have a good (laughs) acronym. I love that. And it turns out to be the largest longitudinal study in existence of girls before puberty with ADHD followed into their teens, 20s, and now in our fifth wave into their 30s. It's not a huge sample, 140 girls with ADHD, 90 match comparisons, but this work simply had not been done uh, much at all before my team and I wrote a grant to the National Institute of Mental Health back in the 90s saying we think ADHD does exist in girls. We need a big enough sample both in the short term in our summer camp programs and following them up over time to get a look at the trajectories. So let me um, cut to the chase with some headlines. In childhood, girls with ADHD, whether it's the purely inattentive kind of ADHD or the combination of 
hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention are just as impaired as boys academically. In fact, often more so academically than boys. Socially, girls with ADHD tend to get rejected more by their neurotypical peers, even more than boys with ADHD do, because again, girls put such a premium on good relationships. We had boys in our summer programs who got thrown out of the peer group, peer rejection, if you want to call it that, by a quarter to a third of their classmates, other boys with ADHD and neurotypical boys. We had girls with ADHD who got rejected by over two thirds of their peers. Oh my so goodness. this is not pretending for good outcomes. So girls with ADHD, again, inattentive or combined presentation, have the same kinds of executive working memory, planning and inhibitory control deficits as do boys. Now let's move longitudinally. So the summer camps were done every few years, a new grant from the government or foundations, and we systematically have followed them up. And we've been very fortunate and very diligent, I might add, to have 92 to 95 percent return each time for the follow up assessment. That's incredible. Which we get accused sometimes of that can't be true. But we're when you run a really good program and the, the, the participants always right, the consumers always right, the customers always right. And we've written reports on them and helped to advocate for them. Um, they kind of pay us back by participating. So here's the, the short story. Boys rather than girls are more likely to end up with delinquency in juvenile hall, et cetera. Some girls are quite aggressive over time, but far fewer than boys. More boys with ADHD, contrasted with the Big Al sample, have problems with substance abuse. Girls have problems with nicotine, but further substances, boys tend to predominate. But during our follow-ups, and this is the conundrum of any longitudinal researcher, you've really got to keep many of the same measures as you had when they were young. If you want to measure change, don't change the measure, because then you've got apples and oranges. But what we also do is add in adolescence, early 20s, late 20s, 30s, newer measures that capture the far end of the developmental spectrum. And so one of the measures we started to add in adolescence was cutting, self-mutilation, non-suicidal self-injury, self-harm, as well as frank suicide attempts, you know, not, not casual, but really attempting to end one's life. And in one of the findings that we published a decade ago that got a lot of notoriety for, and for good reason, we found that girls with ADHD, adjusting for their race, their socioeconomic status, their age, in contrast with a very matched sample of comparison girls, were three to four times more likely to have made a serious suicide attempt and were three times more likely to engage in moderate to severe cutting and self-mutilation. Now, it looked initially as though it was the early impulsivity that was the biggest predictor of that. But as we've gone further, and sadly, even more participants are reporting uh, these experiences in their 20s, early serious inattention also contributes. So it's not just impulsivity, it's the full spectrum of ADHD symptoms. We also know that early experiences of trauma physical abuse, sexual abuse, or neglect. If they're on top of a valid diagnosis of ADHD, the attempted suicide rate, rate went from 22 to 23% of our sample to nearly 34% of the sample. And if you put in other factors, it looks as though this combination of very genetically transmittable low executive function, inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity, in conjunction with early maltreatment and trauma, essentially doubles the risk for serious self-harm. So what we need to do is not get into the endless debates as to whether it's trauma or ADHD. Often it can be both, because many kids who are traumatized may grow up in biological families where there's transmittable ADHD as well, and one plus one starts to equal five, right? Mm -hmm. Also, another outcome uh, that we published a few years ago is that 
about 10% of our matched neurotypical comparison girls, no hint of ADHD, had one or more unplanned pregnancies by their late 20s, compared to 45% of the girls with ADHD. It doesn't take a statistical significance test to say that's a big difference because sexually transmitted infections and with a related finding, the girls with ADHD were three times as likely as our neurotypical comparisons to have experienced intimate partner violence and victimization. So low self-esteem, difficult peer relationships, increasing academic disidentification, teen years, now the transition to post-secondary school or the workforce, unstable relationships, much more difficulty than neurotypical girls in maintaining independence over time. The cascade of depression, anxiety, self-injury, unplanned pregnancies, and many more difficulties in staying with jobs and avoiding getting fired from jobs and higher levels of, of workers' comp, et cetera. This is the typical ADHD presentation. Now, many of our participants are doing well. We're looking for the factors that are predicting such resilience. But to say that ADHD, as we used to think, it doesn't really exist in girls and it kind of goes away when you hit puberty, the more subtle but more virulent symptoms, poor executive functions, poor self-regulation, often continue and escalate over time unless you can target the academics and the peer relationships and the self-esteem deficits. And it's so hard to believe that people didn't believe that ADHD even existed in girls. Not, And it seems like not so long ago. Not so long ago. And in fact, in a, a big review paper that a few grad students and I uh, put into the Journal of Child and Psych Psychology and Psychiatry, got published early in 2022. In the introduction, and we couldn't write a book on this, but in, in, in the brief introduction, we were allowed. This is true in ADHD research. It's true in many other neurodevelopmental disorders. It's true in basic animal physiologic research. Most of the research on animals is done with male species, subspecies only, not females. Right. And when there are both males and females in animal research, most of the investigators don't bother to check for different, different patterns of physiological responses in the males and females. So this is a bias in basic science. The National Institutes of Health 30 years ago said, you've got to justify the representation of males and females and socioeconomic groups and people of color. So that's all good. But even in 2022, we haven't caught up. We're not at parity yet. Right. And it just seems from what you've been saying, when we're when you're talking about the the longitudinal study that you did and the long term impact of ADHD, that ADHD has a significant emotional toll on girls. That's right. And and some of the things you talked about, you know, the predictors, what we think of impulsivity, poor self regulation as being predictors of some of those outcomes. I can imagine that what you talked about before in terms of the peer rejection playing a role as well. Absolutely. So. Peers tend to not want to hang out with kids who interrupt and don't read social cues. And kids with ADHD often <laughs> exhibit such tendencies. But the act of being, think of being expelled from school, pro probably hard to keep up academically. Peer rejection is kind of being expelled from the peer group. Hard to pick up on social cues. Hard to learn the subtle, especially for girls who are often quite verbal, subtle language cues and, and ways of communicating that let people know you're with them. And so the act of being peer rejected doesn't only predict aggressive and externalizing behavior, but is an even stronger predictor of anxiety and depression and, and very low self-esteem. And when you talked about also about um, girls with ADHD later on being more likely to be in abusive relationships and to have unplanned pregnancies, it makes me think about the Roe versus Wade, you know, thing what's happening right now with limiting a woman's right to choose. It's a health concern. It's a mental health concern. We could spend the whole podcast just talking right, about it. Right, we could. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> we really states, could. Some states are now voting and trying to take back control with the uh, Supreme Court decision that relinquishes the federal control over this. But if you're a girl, teen, young woman who has some intrinsic 
deficits and problems in self-regulation, executive function, independence, and may lack access to health care and mental health care, the physical and mental health consequences of lack of proper medical attention can be quite serious. Right. Especially when you're talking about these differences in percentage rates with 40% of girls with ADHD with teenage and unplanned pregnancy versus 10% in, in girls who don't have ADHD. Right. And, um, and we don't have complete data on how many of those unplanned pregnancies were terminated early and how many went to term, et cetera. But we know, as I, I just noted briefly a moment ago, ADHD, autism spectrum disorders, and bipolar disorders are the three mental health and neurodevelopmental conditions that have the strongest genetic liability of, of all, even more than schizophrenia, depression, PTSD. So ADHD can run in families through genetic transmission, as well as through ineffective and overreactive or too lax parenting. They go hand in hand. It's not either or. So you can start to see the risk for intergenerational transmission, both through genes and through parenting that's not optimal. Quote, poor parenting doesn't cause ADHD, but it might maintain it and it might exacerbate it. And as we just talked about, and when you put frank trauma and maltreatment in the picture too, the consequences can get very serious. Right. And I'm thinking about so many girls where treatment is delayed, identific identification of ADHD is delayed. How much do you think stigma plays a role in this? Because it just seems that there's still so much stigma with girls with ADHD, particularly those who are unidentified because of the inconsistency in symptoms. The consistent inconsistency. And I think you're, 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 you're right on here. So go back to basics. HIV is more stigmatized than the flu, right? Schizophrenia is more stigmatized than mild depression. The age old adage and some good research evidence for it too is, Severity and chronicity tend to predict more stigma. However, ADHD, as you aptly point out, still receives a lot of stigma. But wait, people with ADHD on average don't have psychotic thoughts, don't hear voices. They, some may have comorbid depression. But the symptoms of ADHD in middle school, in algebra, you're fine because you're good at math. And in English, where you can't follow what the teacher's saying, you act out and you're you're not focusing. And so the perception is you're just not trying. Why can't you? I saw you pull it together the morning. What about the afternoon? Or you're in the goal in soccer and you do well in practice, but you got distracted by Clover and the opponent's ball went whizzing by your head and they won the game. So the perception is it's just a lack of effort. Everybody can pay better attention if you try harder. So in some interesting ways, milder but more inconsistent conditions may receive more stigma than more severe conditions. Parents of kids with autism spectrum disorders will tell you that if their child has pretty severe autism, language difficulties, many of the classmates will rally around them. It's a very supportive environment. But if you have what used to be called Asperger's, high-functioning autism spectrum, uniformly, other kids and teachers will say, well, that kid's just being weird, especially if you're a girl. There must be something about the way you were raised or just that you just don't seem like you're fully human to not really read those social cues. So in an interesting way, ADHD still receives a lot of stigma. And if you're a girl, you're not supposed to have ADHD. But if you do, well, maybe that's just a made up diagnosis that's covering for you're just not really living out your full girlhood. You should be doing well academically more than boys. You should be doing well socially. So if you're not, there's a lot of blaming the victim. And that leads to this public stigma leads to internalized or self stigma. Maybe I don't deserve to see a therapist. Maybe I am just weird. And there's, of course, structural issues in terms of what is our national health care policy these days? Darned if I know for sure. <laughs> um, but if you're having trouble post-secondarily in terms of education, making ends meet, getting access to good health coverage is a real problem too, which which fits the picture for a lot of girls with ADHD. Right. And that stigma just exacerbates the emotional toll that we talked about before. Vicious cycle. Yeah. Absolutely. 
Now, I mentioned in the intro that you have a book that just came out, Straight Talk About ADHD and Girls, How to Help Your Daughter Thrive. And we've been talking about the difficulties that girls with ADHD face. Is the key to helping girls thrive assessment and treatment? Yes. And here's what's on, I think, page two or three of the book. Okay. If you're the parent and you have a girl who's having trouble at school and is it ADHD and is there ADHD in the family and you get a good diagnosis again. This isn't a brief visit in a pediatrician's office. You need to find people in the community who know how to do this right. Mm -hmm. And parents react with grief. Well, it can't be my daughter or gee, I sort of known this all along and there's ADHD in the family. I didn't want to admit it. And so I borrow two concepts from what's called DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, which is a form of therapy for teens and young adults with really serious emotion dysregulation problems. And one of the principles of DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, is radical acceptance. If you are a person who has always been sensitive, maybe oversensitive, and always been kind of impulsive, and you wear your emotions on your sleeve, if you kick yourself for that and you say, woe is me, well, you're never going to really come around to getting help. You have to radically accept that you may not have the same emotions as, as other people. If you're the parent of a girl with ADHD, you have to radically accept she may not be the daughter you expected. But right along with radical acceptance is radical commitment. If I recognize this, she's going to need more of a reward-based program in home and school than other kids because one of the underpinnings of ADHD is you don't develop a sense of intrinsic motivation the way most other kids do. And you're going to have trouble self-regulating. You may need to go to a medical doctor, child and adolescent psychiatrist, developmental behavioral pediatrician, and consider a medication trial. Because medications can really help if you get the right dose for the right kid of the right medication, get the symptoms to ease off. But we know from a lot of research that on average, kids who get family behavior management, kids who get reward-based programs in school, and as they get older, organizational skills, homework interventions, and who get the right, the lowest dose you can uh, do well on, it's the combination treatment that brings kids the closest to the normal range. And there's one other principle that I would add. In each chapter of the book, I implore parents, what are your daughter's strengths? What does she do well? A, those can be the rewards in your reward system. Maybe it's not what other neurotypical girls like, <laughs> stamp collecting, it's animal husbandry, it's a special activity. And B, give her ways to develop that skill. Maybe she's going to have a career that's not as traditional as others, but humans do well when they're intrinsically rewarded for things that they enjoy and can thrive in. So finding strengths as well as repairing some of the executive and academic and social deficits, those go hand in hand. Absolutely. The strengths are so important because that can also tie into that self-concept, the self-concept issue. Absolutely. I'm not flawed. I'm not weird. I'm not the kid that nobody wants to be with. And we talked about you know peer relationships and rejection. A lot of research has shown over the last 20, 30 years at least one high quality good friendship can outweigh some rejection from the, the, the larger group of peers because now you've got a buddy, you've got someone can understand and uh, friendships are still undervalued. Maybe some of the behaviors that boys and girls with ADHD display don't always make them the most popular, but high quality friendships are really important and parents can do a lot to help support structured play dates at the beginning and then fading themselves out to get girls into better social relationships. And and you've just highlighted that there are effective ADHD treatments, interventions, and different types of support for girls. And it seems that if we are able to use evidence-based approaches to assessment, identification, we get those treatments and supports in place, that we can alleviate symptoms, increase competence, and even reduce stigma. Absolutely. And family distress can vanish. We One of the many papers we published from the Beagle st study, uh, my uh, now colleague, former grad student, Chanel Gordon, who's now works at Boys Town, 
in the Midwest, found that even more than the parents of boys with ADHD, the parents of girls with ADHD have a lot of parenting stress. What did I do wrong? My daughter should be thrived. Girls are supposed to thrive. Boys are hell on wheels for a long time, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and it's that parenting stress that is a key predictor of some of the very difficult negative long-term outcomes. So in a behavioral family approach, parent management training, it's not just reward charts. It's not just finding the right re reinforcers. It's not just promoting strengths. It's taking it a step at a time. It's being clearer and firmer with limits and also hugely reversing. I mean, we talk to families and there's data on this. For every one positive thing we say to our daughter, there's five or 10 negative things. Reverse that, flip it. The more positive and smooth the interactions, the more strengths-based the approach, the whole family climate can improve and the stress can lessen. Dr. Hinshaw, this has been such a great conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, your research with our listeners. I'm absolutely going to put a link to your book in the show notes so people can pick it up. It's really important Thanks. to really understand how ADHD shows up in girls and how to support them. And I really appreciate your time and all your contributions to the field. Well, as usual, thanks for your great and perceptive questions. Uh, I love the work you're doing through this podcast and everything else. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's conversation. I hope you found the conversation insightful and helpful. If you enjoyed the episode, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an update. And if you have a moment, I would love for you to leave a review. It helps us to reach more listeners like you who are looking for practical strategies and support. And remember, you can always learn more and find additional resources at childnexus.com. Thank you so much for being part of our community. Until next time. Thanks for listening to Diverse Thinking, Different Learning by Child Nexus. For more resources, visit us online at childnexus.com.